Well, I'm a master student at Jonathan Schick's lab and I'm doing my master thesis with the co-supervision of Benjamin Conlon as well. And I'm looking at how fungal cultivars from fungus farming ants cope with plant defenses by comparing fungus from leaf cutter ants to those from non leaf cutter ants. My hypothesis is that fungal cultivars from leaf cutter ants should resist better plant defenses as they have been uh, fed with fresh living plant material throughout evolutionary history. And thus they should show better performance under the influence of plant defenses. So to test this, what I'm doing is extracting fungus from fungus garden from different species, both of leaf cutter and non leaf cutter ants. And I'm checking how they grow in different plates with different diets, uh, with different plant toxins. And uh, then I am checking the performance and growth of the fungus. I have already found some results that basically show the negative impact of the plant defenses on fungal growth and also how this differs between species. And I'm looking forward to share them with you in the breakout room later. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Martha. Yes. And our next poster uh, presenter is Dr. Holly Marshall. Dr. Marshall, she is a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. Hi, Marshall. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. My name's Holly. Um, as Bital just said, I'm a postdoc currently in Edinburgh. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my previous PhD work, where we identified potentially imprinted genes in a species of bumblebee. Um, more generally, though, I'm interested in epigenetics, and earlier this year, we also identified allele-specific DNA methylation, and we think this may act as a potential imprinting mark in this species. Um, well, actually, I think it might not, so if you do want to discuss that, then do come along to the breakout room. Um, and just while I've got you all, I wanted to mention that um, the allele-specific work was also done with Alan Jones, and Alan is currently looking for a postdoc, so if you need someone with some really excellent bioinformatics skills, um, then do reach out to him. But yeah, epigenetics and imprinting genes, if you want to discuss those, um, then do come to the breakout room. Thank you. Yes. Uh, our third poster presenter is uh, Yang Quayler. He's a PhD student at the University of Kowalina. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Jan. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Groningen, and my poster is on the evolution of caste-specific aging in social insects. And many of you probably know that social insect queens can become extraordinarily long compared to their workers. And the, the, yeah, the explanation for this typically is uh, the exposure of uh, caste to caste-specific extrinsic mortality. And we tested this idea in an aging model for social insects. Uh, our model shows that lifespan differences evolve even in the absence of extrinsic mortality and that other factors actually drive the evolution of lifespan divergences such as reproductive division of labor, antagonistic pleiotropy and differential resource investment in the castes. Uh, if you want to discuss this further, then come and join me in the breakout room. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, our next poster presenter is Ash Wang. He's a third year PhD student at Royal Halloween University of London. Ed, are you with us? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm here. Sure. Yeah, there we go. Um, hello, my name's Ed Straw. Um, I'm talking to you today about herbicides like Roundup pictured on the screen here. Um, herbicides are assumed to be bee safe. Um, what that means is that you're allowed to spray these herbicides directly onto uh, like flowering plants, including weeds, um, even while bees are foraging on them. Um, because they're assumed to be safe to, for bees, um, what we thought we'd do is quite a, a simple methodology, which was just to spray herbicides onto bees uh, and see what happened. Um, what we ended up seeing over 24 hours was anywhere from 30% to 95% mortality uh, when we sprayed pesticides onto the bees. Um, this is quite alarming because these substances are bee safe. Um, it really did depend on what kind of substance we were using. Um, and if you want to come join me in the breakout room, uh, I can run over some of the, the interesting parts of it um, as to, to what specific ingredients were causing the, the horrible sort of like a bee that looks like it's been dunked in hair gel there. Um, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And our last uh, uh, poster presenter is a Matty. Uh, she's a PhD student at the EDU of Guas. Hi, Matty. Hey, hi. 
I'm here. Okay. Okay, hello everybody. So I am Matti, and in my experiment, we exposed colonies of the ant Cardiogondola obscuria to the herbicide glyphosate in their food. We then measured the sizes of new workers and new queens born in these colonies, and also quantified the uh, relative numbers of these two uh, bacterial endosymbionts by QPCR. And what we found was that in the glyphos glyphosate treatment, the number of endosymbionts were re uh, reduced. And regarding the size in workers, we found no differences. But in the queens, however, the thorax was significantly wider in the glyphosate treatment uh, compared to the control. And I like to speculate that this may be because um, of investment in flight muscles in the queens, making the thorax bigger. And I'd love to discuss these results with you and hear your uh, ideas and comments. So please join me in my room later. Thank you.